21 people died. Some were drowned immediately. Some were crushed to death. Some were trapped and drowned slowly. They died in an industrial accident. It's also true that the accident sounds ridiculous. The Boston Molasses Flood was caused by the bursting of a gigantic tank holding 2.3 million gallons of molasses. The tank was in the middle of a crowded neighborhood, the north end of Boston. When the tank burst, the molasses burst out of it going 35 miles an hour, moving in a way of 25 feet high and 160 feet wide. It killed people, it killed horses, it knocked buildings off their foundations, it crushed buildings, it crushed and twisted the elevated rail, it flushed cars and trucks and wagons into the harbor with people still in them. And here we are all these years later, more than a hundred years later, and the Boston molasses flood sounds like a punchline. I get angry sometimes when I think about this because it's such a horrible way to die, and also all these years later, it sounds ridiculous. I, I even find it funny. I'm not going to tell you not to laugh at the concept Boston molasses flood. It objectively is a pretty funny concept. What I am going to do is tell you the factors that led up to it step by step and let you get to know the circumstances of the people killed a little bit, and hopefully by the end of the video you'll be as angry as I am on the behalf of the victims, and you'll be able to take an objective look around you at the factors that you see in your own life that might resemble what led to the disaster. Before I go on, please note this video is a little unusual for me in that most of my information comes from one volume. It's a book called Dark Tide by Stephen Polio. This book is it's excellent. It is the only comprehensive source on the molasses flood that's readily available to the public. And anyone with even a passing interest in this event, get yourself a copy, read it, you'll be glad you did. Polio's own sources are huge, extensive, rich, and a lot harder to access, so we're all very lucky that he created this book. A major source for this book is the transcript of the three years of molasses flood hearings known as Door versus Industrial Alcohol. And I'm reading his citations. This is the 40 volume, 25,000 page transcript of the three years of molasses flood hearings housed in the Social Law Library in Boston, Massachusetts, who are very nice folks and will let you go there as a guest and read a selection of the 40 volumes if you ever wish to do so. But for the rest of us, we're extremely lucky we've got this. It occurs to me that some people might not have encountered molasses in their day to day. So it's a sweet syrup that's a sugar byproduct. And you can buy it in the grocery stores, even to this day. It's a little bit unusual tasting. It's sweet, but it's also a little bit sour, a little bit almost savory. And it's a very dark reddish brown, almost black, when you have a big container full of it. Molasses also behaves very differently at different temperatures. Here we have molasses that has been kept at room temperature, roughly 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It flows beautifully. It's syrupy and thicker than water. This molasses has been kept in the refrigerator and is around 40 degrees. It still flows, but it's much thicker. It's almost hard. It's definitely viscous. You can see it piling up on that plate. A lot of it is still coating the glass, reluctant to come out. Finally, here's our molasses that was in the freezer around zero degrees Fahrenheit. Look at that surface. It has so much sugar in it that I doubt it could freeze solid, but it is extremely thick. That does not want to flow. Look at that ribbon. It'll stay nice and thick and pile up on the plate. It's got almost a leathery texture to it. You can tell it visually from the room temperature and fridge molasses.
I'll draw you a little squiggle. I'll put my finger in. So yeah, I'm good and stuck. So that is the zero degree Fahrenheit molasses. Initially, the city tried to use water from the city water mains to wash away the molasses that coated the North End following the explosion of the tank. You can see the room temperature molasses does dissolve a little bit, but it's still pretty sticky. The nearly zero degree molasses is still on there, good and solid. The city eventually started pumping in salt water from the harbor directly onto the molasses, and that cut through the molasses a lot better than the cold fresh water was doing. Molasses was also cheaper than buying sugar, historically at least. The poorer you were, the more likely you were to be using molasses for all of the things that people today would use white sugar for. It was also the main ingredient in rum, which historically was manufactured on a wide scale in New England. The molasses we're concerned with belongs to the U.S. Industrial Alcohol Company. We're going to call them USIA going forward. The molasses is shipped in, delivered to the tank, which is on the waterfront, then it's loaded into rail cars and taken to a distilling plant in Cambridge, and there it's made into industrial alcohol, which is a key ingredient in explosives. And as you can imagine, the demand for industrial alcohol was intense during the First World War. Even before the U.S. entered the war, USIA was seeing a huge demand for their product. At the time that the tank was built, USIA really wanted to up their operation because they were hoping to get a government contract in the event that the U.S. entered the war. The tank is in a neighborhood of Boston known as the North End. If you look at a map of Boston, it's the top right-hand bump sticking out into the harbor. This is an old part of town. Paul Revere used to live there, just for example, and you can actually go to his home as it's a historical museum these days. If you've heard of the Old North Church, one if by land, two if by sea, that's also in the North End. Copps Hill is in the middle of the North End, and there's a street curving around it called Commercial Street, which is one of the main thoroughfares. We're going to spend a lot of time on Commercial Street in this story. On the water side of Commercial Street, there are wharves, and on the landward side, there are people's homes. Packed in very closely, overwhelmingly brick tenement style houses and a few wooden frame houses. Down the middle of Commercial Street runs an elevated rail line. By the end of the 19th century, the North End had become a neighborhood of new immigrants. Irish immigrants, Jewish immigrants, and overwhelmingly, at the end of the 19th century, Italian immigrants, mostly from the south of Italy, and the number of Italian immigrants living in the North End skyrocketed through the early years of the 20th century. It was an overwhelmingly Italian neighborhood by the time of our story. It was also an incredibly densely populated area. As of the 1910 census, there were over 30,000 people packed into the residential area, which is about a square half mile, and the numbers only went up from 1910 on. Looming over this neighborhood is the tank. It's 50 feet tall, 90 feet across, 240 feet in circumference. It's painted gray. When this thing is full, it can hold 2.3 million gallons of molasses. To give you some idea of what volume of liquid that is, if you've ever seen an Olympic-sized swimming pool, this tank can hold three and a half times the volume of that swimming pool. Long before the disaster I'm about to describe took place, people had in fact guessed that if that tank were to burst, it would kill a lot of people and do tremendous property damage. So the question, for me, for a lot of people now, is why did they build it in the North End at all? True, it needs to be near a waterfront because the molasses is going to come on ships and it needs to be near a rail line because the molasses will have to go in rail cars to the factory where they distill it into alcohol. But even so, surely USIA could have found some place to put the tank that wasn't near anybody's home. I think this has been downplayed in recent decades, but anti-Italian bigotry used to be a huge thing especially in the U.S. There are older people who can remember a lot of experiences like this themselves. It's far from something that has disappeared in the past. 
for the most part, it was stuff straight out of the generalized playbook of ethnic prejudices, but also one very particularly aimed at Italians negative ethnic stereotype that I think I should hit now because it's going to come up later too, is that Italians are anarchists, that they're naturally violent and particularly in an anti-state, anti-order, and anti-capitalism way. One of the people who was a focus of anti-Italian sentiment and the conflation of being Italian with being an anarchist is Luigi Galliani, who is living in Taunton, Mass. at this point. He's about to be deported for being a dangerous radical. He's a newspaper publisher for anarchists, by anarchists. It is his avowed principle that the institutions of capitalism have to be taken down violently. And there is a lot of prejudice against Italians in general, which extends this to smear all Italians as being violent anarchists who want to bomb you. But also, short of that being a stereotype, it is the case that a lot of Italians who come to the U.S. are arriving not able to read, not having learned a skilled trade, and therefore they're being smeared by the concept of, well, they're unteachable, they're shiftless, blah blah blah, you know, the sort of thing. And that means there are not a lot of opportunities for Italians in Boston at large, not in skilled trades, not in the professions, not by and large. One of the side effects of all of this is that Italian Americans have close to zero political clout. So that means that the populace of the North End, their power is zilch when it comes to being able to make any meaningful protest to having a terrifically dangerous, as it turns out, industrial site put in place right next door. This story doesn't have a single human villain. Please remember that. The villains here are USIA as an overall company, and the lack of industrial regulation and concern for human life and well-being in the US at this time and earlier. A villain of this story is the pressure of capitalism making people prioritize things like keep my job and bring the project in on time over be absolutely certain this project isn't going to kill a lot of people down the road. So the villains are systems. The problems are systems. There is not one particular villain who caused all of this and who we can blame. With that said, if there were a villain in the story whom I designated, it would be Arthur P. Gell. Arthur P. Gell is a treasurer for USIA. His office is at the Cambridge Distilling Plant. He is not an engineer. He's not an architect. He has been a treasurer his entire career. In late 1914, USIA made him effectively project manager on constructing a tank in Boston. And the project was a project management nightmare, to be fair. The war had just kicked off, the demand for industrial alcohol was tremendous and going up all the time. USIA in 1914 didn't have a supply chain in place. They could distill alcohol, but they were getting it from third-party suppliers. If they could establish a supply chain of their own, they would be able to do a lot better business. The tank is the secret to that. They're going to invest in steamships to carry the molasses from Cuba, where it's made, to Boston, where it's turned into alcohol. What they need is the tank to offload it from ships and then take it in factory-sized amounts to be distilled. It falls to gel to make this happen. He spent most of the year 1915 struggling to lease the property. He finally leased the property after months more than he'd expected to spend on that process. In late September 1915, he signs a lease on the property and he hires the Hugh Non Construction Company to build the concrete pad, forming a foundation that the tank will sit on. That was November 1915. Meanwhile, Gel hires the Hammond Iron Works as contractor to actually build the tank. It's going to be made out of gigantic steel plates that will be riveted together. Happening also during November, but due to various setbacks, the plates weren't delivered until the beginning of December 1915. Just as the concrete foundations are finished, the plates are finally starting to be delivered. And now Arthur P. Gell is really under the gun. 
because USIA has already ordered that ship full of molasses. It's going to be here in Boston on the 31st of December. Jill's career is on the line now. If he doesn't have the tank ready when the ship full shows up, he could lose his job, he could lose his respect and reputation. And as if that weren't enough. Now it's the beginning of December and Hammond Ironworks is telling him that they have to apply for building permits to build the tank. Jell tells them that that won't be necessary because Hugh Non Construction Company got a building permit to make the foundations, and that also covers everything Hammond Ironworks is going to do. He's correct. That's the extent of the requirement for building the tank. The Boston Building Department classifies the tank as a receptacle, not a building. As it's a receptacle, Hammond Ironworks does not have to have a separate building permit than the people who build the foundation did. Hammond Ironworks did considerately go above and beyond what was required of them and include specifications of what the tank is going to look like with the foundation permit. So the city does have that on file. The specifications go into some detail about how thick the plates are going to be that form the sides of the tank. This turns out to be false. The steel plates that are actually delivered in December of 1915 are up to 10% thinner than what they said in the specs the plates were going to be. Jell's contribution to the safety plans for the tank begin and end with this. He once heard somewhere that comparable tanks are built with a safety factor of two. So he decides that the tank should be built with a safety factor of three, and that should cover it just fine. I had to look up factor of safety for this video because I didn't know what it meant. Turns out that is how much stronger a construction project needs to be than its intended purpose. For example, to take a silly example, if I build a chair that can take the weight of exactly one April, then that chair has a safety factor of one. But you wouldn't want to build a chair that had only a safety factor of one, because what if I'm wearing clothes when I sit on that chair, or I have a rock in my pocket, or I've just had a filling meal? So construction normally needs to be stronger than everyday usage would require, because what if there are extraordinary circumstances? Much later, an expert is going to testify that a safety factor of between three and four would have been normal for a construction project of this scale. However, Due to the construction of the tank with plates much thinner than they said they would be using, the tank actually had a safety factor at best of 1.8. Early in 1915, Jell reviews the building specs with their representative. In an amazing example of nominative determinism, the representative from Hammond Ironworks is a Mr. Shellhammer. The thickness of the tank walls might have been discussed, it might not. It didn't register with Jell enough that he could talk about it afterwards with any certainty. Definitely they don't talk about what the factor of safety should be, Hammond Ironworks doesn't advise Jell, and Jell never questions whether they're actually on track to build the tank with a safety factor of three. USIA has engineers on staff. None of them are in Boston. None of them are remotely involved in this project. It's just Jell and the contractors, and that's it. The tank goes up. There are even more setbacks. It's December 8th. A workman falls 40 feet inside the tank and he dies, and Jell has to lose half a day's work. There's a storm. Jell loses two and a half days of work to the storm. It's Christmas. Jell loses December 25th because Christmas. He loses December 26th to the weather. He makes up for lost time by telling the Hammond Ironworks crew to work around the clock. Night and day, they are riveting this tank. Either the neighbors don't object, or nobody with the power to stop them from making a lot of noise riveting is able to object to this in any meaningful way, because the work goes on, day and night. It's nearly the end of December, the tank is nearly ready. Him and Ironworks' contract says that the tank has to be filled to the top with water to check it for leaks at this point. Jell realizes that's going to take time that he doesn't have. It's nearly the 31st. Filling the tank with water pumped in through the built-in pipeline from the harbor would take days, maybe weeks. He does not have that kind of time before the ship shows up. What he does instead, he has the tank pumped full of six inches of water. The water is six inches deep. 
in the bottom of a 50-foot tall tank. There are no leaks. Jell considers it done. It's December 29th, 1915. They did it. They finished it. It's done. It's under schedule. Two days later, that tanker shows up right on time, full of molasses, directly from Cuba, and they pump it into the tank. This fills the tank 13 feet deep immediately with molasses. Jell has been on this project for more than a year. It's done at last, and in all the ways that he knows how to measure, he's done a great job. He sends a letter to him at Ironworks, thanking them for going above and beyond in their efforts, and he goes back to his office at the distilling plant in Cambridge. He hires a superintendent, William White, for the tank site. Also, they hire a rent-a-cop from the city of Boston for security because there has been a series of anarchist bombings recently, and because the anarchists are against the war, and because... USIA is a military contractor who is supplying um, material that's used to make explosives, they could potentially be a target of anti-war violent activity. Now the tank's active, USIA ramps up their production. Even before the US enters the war, they're making a lot more money. Their stock shoots up. From 2% returns in 1914 to 36% returns in 1916. The tank is regularly filled nearly to capacity, with two million gallon loads. The tank starts leaking almost immediately. It leaks a lot. It leaks from every seam. Enough molasses stays inside the tank that USIA isn't terribly concerned that they're losing money on these leaks. But the leaks are all over the tank and they're nearly constantly visible. Especially when the weather warms up. The leaks get stronger when the molasses becomes warmer and more liquefied. The tank also makes noises. It makes a rumbling noise like distant thunder. It makes a bubbling noise. People who work nearby call it boiling. Now, they don't mean that it's raised to a boiling temperature. They mean that there's a bubbling noise like a pot of boiling water coming from in that tank. Families in the area realized pretty quickly that the sides of the tank were a source for free molasses. No one cared, it was being wasted, it was pouring out onto the ground, and the employees of USIA would dump sand over it to stop it from being sticky or slippery. So as far as some local families were concerned, it was fair game. Little kids would be sent over there by their parents with little tin pails to hold them up against the sides of the tank where the drips ran down until the pail filled and then take it home to their families. Or if they weren't sent over there by their grown-ups, they would go over there themselves and put their finger in the molasses and lick it off because it's incredibly sweet. They would put little sticks into it and lick the sticks off. The USIA employees or the people working in the rail yard next door had to chase these kids off, but they kept coming back. In February 1916, USIA hires Isaac Gonzalez to be general man. That's his title at the tank site. He has to do a lot of hands-on work. He has to supervise personally when the ships pump in molasses. He has to watch the tank controls and be responsible for seeing it safely offloaded into rail cars to take to the distilling plant. He reports to William White and White reports to Jell. Gonzalez is an interesting man. Born and grew up in Puerto Rico, was a sailor for four years, including on molasses ships. He'd done a lot of other things in between then and the molasses tank. For a while he worked in Washington, D.C. as a lawyer's messenger, then for a while he was an engine repairman. Before he came to work for USIA, he was kind of down on his lock between jobs and living at the YMCA, so getting this job is a huge stroke of luck for him. It is going to become a horrendous nightmare for him. We also don't have a hero in this story. We just have ordinary people who are trying to do their best. With that said, if I was going to designate a hero, it would be Isaac Gonzalez. From context, we can tell he has a tremendously active conscience. He's the only person in this situation who manages to gather all the information from context to know that the tank could collapse, and that if it did collapse, it would kill a lot of people. And he's also, ultimately the only person who knows all the facts and actually tries to act on them and prevent the disaster. He hears the tank rumbling. He reports the leaks to White and then to Arthur P. Gell. 
But a lot more immediate of a problem is the fact that he can see that the tank is not in good condition at all. Remember how I said he has to do hands-on work? That includes, before they have a delivery, he has to go into a hatch in the top of the big empty tank, go down inside the tank, and make sure that the pipe for inflow of molasses is clear and in good working order. When he does this and the tank is empty, big, round, rusty flakes of steel are falling off the inside of the tank like snow onto him. Onto his clothes, his hair, into the bottom of the tank around him. They scatter down constantly. By the spring of 1917, Gonzalez is so worried about something happening to the tank that he is sleeping on site. There's an area called the pump pit right outside the tank where the controls are located. He's sleeping in there. In April 1917, he bypasses his immediate supervisor, William White, and he goes to Arthur P. Jell's office in Cambridge to see him personally. He tells Jell he's afraid that the tank will fall. And he shows him the flakes of rusty metal falling off the inside of the tank that he has gathered up and brought with him in his pockets. He says, these fall like snow onto my hair and into my clothes each time I go into the tank. Jell brushes him off. Jell says, in part, the tank still stands. The tank will stand. Gonzalez tells him that he is so worried that something will happen to the tank that he has been sleeping in the pump pit. He says, and this is a direct quote, I'm afraid the tank is not safe, and if it should start to fall, I can sound a warning. Please note, Gonzalez understands the situation the best of anybody here. He's got all the information to know that the tank could collapse, and he's guessing correctly that if it does, it will kill people. But also, even he is still picturing the collapse as happening slowly enough that he could wake up, warn people, and get them all out of the way so they won't be drowned when the molasses hits. My point is, nobody knows how fast the molasses flood is going to happen when it happens. Everyone's picturing it as happening as slowly. Nobody knows how fast it can burst out when it does burst out. Even the man with the best understanding of the situation. It's just unthinkable to them. Anyway, it all shakes out with Jell telling Gonzalez, you can't sleep on sight. Go home, stop worrying about it. Gonzalez does stop sleeping on sight, but he can't stop worrying about it. He knows how bad things could be. It's on his mind day and night. A few days later, it gets worse. He's on the job, and he gets a crank phone call from someone claiming to be an anarchist threatening to blow up the tank. Gonzalez tells White. White brushes it off. Gonzalez goes past White to contact the city police, and the police send a guard round to mount a guard on the tank for the next 24 hours. They have a big blowout about this. White calls him foolish. Gonzalez says that he doesn't care if it's foolish. If the police took it seriously enough to send in officers, then it's worth taking seriously. So the U.S. is in the war. USIA is distilling alcohol as fast as they possibly can. In the year 1918, alone, the tank is filled up to the two million gallon mark seven times. Filled and emptied, filled and emptied, and it keeps leaking and making bubbling and groaning noises. The noises get worse after a new delivery. By the summer of 1918, Gonzalez can't sleep at night. He and his wife live in St. Germain Street in Back Bay, more than two miles away. Gonzalez starts getting up in the night and running across the city to the tank site and checking on the tank. Because if he lies down in his bed and he tries to sleep, he has these terrible waking dreams of something awful happening to the tank and the resulting deaths. And he could do something to prevent this, but he doesn't quite have a way to make sure that it's not going to happen. What he does do is let himself into the tank site and then open the outflow pipe from the tank and let an enormous quantity of molasses out of the tank to just flow out into Boston Harbor. The idea is to relieve the pressure inside the tank that's making those rumbling sounds. Maybe when he does this the rumbling sounds decrease, maybe they don't. No one notices that he is doing this at the time. No one is paying enough attention to notice that they've lost a lot of molasses to Gonzalez just trying to relieve the pressure in the tank. It makes him feel better, or anyway, it makes him feel less bad. Then he turns around and goes home while it's still dark out, maybe gets some more sleep, and then turns around and goes right back to the north end for another day of work on the tank site. This is destroying him. 
He doesn't go over there every night, but it's real often and it's increasing in its frequency. It's summer, it's hot. People who work at the paving yard nearby or at the railway are remarking on the tank making those boiling sounds. Sometime in July, Gonzalez lets it slip to White that he's been getting up in the night and running across the city to check on the tank because he's so worried that something bad will happen that he could have prevented. Sometime after that, White told Jell about that interaction. In August, Jell acts on this information. He sends a painting crew. Remember that tank is grey? They paint it brown. The entire tank is now brown to match the molasses drips out the sides. They're still happening, they're just less visible. That's it. That's the response from Jell. On September 1st, 1918, Isaac Gonzalez quits. He joins the army. The war ends right after that, so Gonzalez spends his entire term of enlistment in Columbus, Ohio, and is a long way away when all of the really bad stuff happens at the tank site. It's January 12th, 1919. The steamship Miliero from Cuba, full of molasses, reaches Boston and starts pumping molasses into the tank. Miliero was actually constructed locally at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy and she has been a USIA subsidiary-owned ship for some time. Her usual beat is to take a small amount of petroleum south to Cuba, then take a full shipment of molasses north. She's got 1.3 million gallons of molasses straight from Cuba. It's 11.20 a.m. they begin pumping it into the tank. The new molasses is still quite warm. It's normal for the molasses to be loaded into the ship in Cuba at 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and only have cooled by about 10 degrees when it gets to Boston. There is a heating device on the pipeline so that if the molasses is flowing slowly, it can be warmed and therefore made to move more quickly. But that won't be necessary today. The molasses is warm and it's flowing briskly. Even so, that's a lot of liquid. It takes nearly 24 hours to pump out the ship. They pump continuously all through the night and into the next morning at 10.40 a.m. on January 13th, they've emptied the ship and filled the tank. The outdoor temperature is below freezing. At night it gets down to two degrees. It's been cold for a while, it's January 1919, remember. And there was already molasses in that tank, which had been there so long that it was the same temperature as the outdoor air. Due to the way the pipeline works, the molasses is pumped in from the ship, through the pipeline, and into the bottom of the tank. So there is now this huge warm mass of new molasses bulging up under a layer of leathery, very firm, cold molasses that's been sitting in the tank a long time. So inside the tank, it balloons upwards, essentially carrying a gigantic thick plug of cold molasses upwards in the tank on stretched out on the top of a load of new warm molasses. This touches off a fermentation reaction in the new molasses. It starts producing bubbles of fermentation gases. The tank immediately starts making bubbling and groaning noises. The molasses inside that tank now weighs 26 million pounds total. It's 2.3 million gallons, coming almost to the very top of a 50-foot high tank. More than half that molasses is new and relatively warm, pinned down under old, hard, cold molasses. The warm is expanding internally. The old, hard, cold molasses is pressing outward against the sides all around the tank. And then there's a thaw. The outdoor temperature rises to around 40 degrees by midday of January 15th, 1919. It's a nice mild day in the North End. Here are some of the people who were going about their day near the USIA tank site on that Wednesday. On the same side of Commercial Street as the tank, there's a firehouse. This is on the waterfront, it's the home of the Engine 31 fireboat. The firemen, plus a man named John Barry, who was a stonecutter for the city of Boston, who worked next door, are hanging out talking and some of them are playing cards. Across the street, on the other side of the elevated train tracks, is the Clarity household. The breadwinner for the family is Martin Clarity, who runs a newspaper men's club called the Pen and Pencil Club. And since he works late nights, he's still asleep at the time that we're about to describe. He lives with his sister Teresa, his brother Stephen, their mother Bridget, 
and at least two borders. Most of the houses in the area are multi-story brick buildings, but they live in the three-story wooden frame house. Right next to the tank, at 12.41pm, there are three little kids. Siblings Maria and Antonio de Stasio, and their friend Pasquale Yantosca. They are on their lunch break from Paul Revere Elementary School. Remember, this is the old days. At lunch, they send you all the way home to eat with your family, and then you all go all the way back to school for afternoon classes. And they have been detailed to pick up firewood in the space between the railway and the tank, so they're right next to the tank. Maria is picking up firewood, and Bay State Railroad employees, including a man named James McMullen, are yelling at her to get off the property. Pasquale Yantosca's parents are getting lunch ready in their tenement home, and they just looked out the window and saw Pasquale with his friends being yelled at by the railway workers. In the North End paving yard, there are stonecutters, pavers, blacksmiths at work in and around multiple buildings. Also on the same side of the street as the tank, the Boston and Maine Railroad Company sheds, there are people loading and unloading freight. In the harbor, Navy ships, the Bessie J and the USS Nantucket training ship. On the elevated railroad line, the trains are running as they normally would on a Wednesday. Currently on a train headed north, from South Station to North Station, through the North End, along the middle of Commercial Street, on the elevated line is a brakeman named Royal Albert Lehman. And one more of our players, William White, the USIA tank superintendent. He took off on his lunch break because his wife had just phoned and asked if he wanted to have lunch with her in downtown and help her pick out some new dresses at Jordan Marsh, so he's off having lunch and a shopping expedition with his wife. At 12.41 p.m., people near the tank heard a roar and felt the ground shake. Some people heard a rattle like machine gun bullets. People who were facing the tank at the time saw a huge wall of blackness surge towards them and blot out the light. This happened all around the tank at once. Remember, it's cylindrical in shape. The molasses burst outwards under high pressure in all directions, so that the roof of the tank dropped straight down upon the foundation, directly underneath it. The rivets burst outwards from the tank in all directions and went flying, shattering windows, embedding themselves in walls. That was what the machine gun fire-like sound was. The wave burst out in all directions, carrying people, horses, automobiles, rubble, houses, along with it. It drowned Maria D'Astasio on the spot. It threw her brother Antonio against a lamppost and fractured his skull. The wave knocked the firehouse off of its foundation with the people still inside it, slid it almost into the water, and right on the waterfront dropped it again, so hard that the ground floor crumpled into itself. The men who had been inside it were trapped in an 18-inch high space with rubble on top of them, beams, furniture, collapsed, pinning them down in most cases, and the molasses flowing down the waterfront continued to fill up that 18-inch high space under the building where they were trapped. One of them was John Barry, the stonecutter who had been over there to visit. He was trapped, pinned face down under rubble, only able to breathe by swinging his arm like this to clear the molasses away from his mouth and nose. He would swing, struggle, it was his only free limb. The rest of him was completely immobile, and there was a pile of heavy stuff on top of him. He was in agonizing pain from injuries to his back. He just kept on clawing with his hand. He could hear the other men trapped around him beginning to call and scream for help. The other men are alive around him, and also trapped, and can't get to him or free themselves. One of them is George Leahy, one of the firemen. He's pinned down under a pool table. He's in the molasses, and he's in a position where it's rising up to and over his face, and he can't keep his head above the level of the liquid. Barry and the others can hear him shouting, Help me! Oh, God! And they call out to him to hang in there. Hang on. Hang on. And then they don't hear any more from George Leahy. In the other direction, the molasses wave knocks the Clarity family home off its foundations and carries it along until it reaches the side of Copps Hill, 
where the wave bursts like surf bursting against a cliff. Then, the molasses flowing back downhill towards the water drags the Clarity House back with it until it rams into a still stable section of the elevated train tracks and smashes the house into rubble and wedges the rubble under the train tracks. Martin Clarity just experienced a series of events that to him look like this. He wakes up, his sister Teresa is shaking him because she was due to wake him uh, just after 12.30 anyway because he has an appointment. She looks around, she looks at the window, she screams out, and then a wave of blackness hits the house. And now he is struggling in molasses, clawing for anything that can get him up out of it so he won't drown or choke. He finds his bedstead from his bedroom, which has also been knocked out of the house by the force of the molasses, and he crawls onto it like a raft. Then he's able to rescue his sister Teresa, who is clawing in the flood of molasses. He pulls her up onto the bed frame. They manage to rescue their brother Stephen. Stephen is developmentally delayed. He has also been flung from the house by the force of the molasses. He's alive. He's horrified and frightened and doesn't understand what's going on any more than the rest of them do. Their mother, Bridget, didn't make it out. She was crushed to death when the building collapsed. The sheets of steel that had formed the walls of the tank blew outwards in all directions, and one of them scythed across Commercial Street, took out the support of the elevated train line, and the train tracks buckled and collapsed almost all the way into the street. Remember Royal Albert Lehman, the brakeman in that train car on the elevated line? When the tank exploded. The explosion took out the train line right behind their train. If they had been 10 or 15 seconds slower in reaching that point, they'd have been swept into the flood along with the train on the tracks. As it was, the tracks shake horribly and then tilt backwards, and the train starts to roll backwards down the section of track they were just on towards the site of the collapse. Lehman slams on the brake and manages to get the train stopped just in time to not go into the collapsed section. Then he saved a lot of lives by what he did next. He struggles along the tracks to the guard shack, which is a little way ahead, and he tells the guard to stop the next train coming from North Station. And then, oh my god, the train that was coming after his train. It's going to be here any moment. Royal Albert Lehman descends the collapsed section, somehow doesn't get swept into the still flowing molasses at the bottom, climbs up the other side of the collapse, and here comes the next train from South Station coming at him at 20 miles an hour. He stands blocking the tracks with his body, shouting, THE TRACK IS DOWN! And the oncoming train manages to stop in time to not kill him or go into the molasses. Firemen and police and sailors from the ships in the harbor all start the rescue efforts. There are a lot of people drowned. There are a lot of people still alive, but with horrific crushing injuries. Broken bones, internal injuries, bruising. The rescuers who find people alive but injured take the victims to the Haymarket Relief Station. This is the closest medical site. It's not really a hospital, it's the equivalent of an urgent care. It's almost immediately overwhelmed by casualties who have life-threatening injuries and are also coated in molasses. The rescuers are coated in molasses. The Haymarket Relief Station is soon encrusted with molasses. It's filling the front hall. It's tracked all the way down into the street. A Dr. George McGrath, who is the Suffolk County Medical Examiner, was on his way to work at the mortuary when the explosion happened. So he helps with the rescue efforts as much as he can, wearing rubber waders in the molasses. He said later that the bodies looked as if they were covered in heavy oil skins. So thick was the molasses that was wrapping the bodies of the dead people and the bodies and the skin of the injured living people being carried from the wreckage. The molasses is still knee-deep an hour after the tank blew. George Leahy is drowned. He is dead under the firehouse. Everyone else is still trapped in there, but they're still alive. Everyone but Leahy is eventually rescued alive from the firehouse. The last to be rescued is John Barry the Stonecutter who suffers an hours-long ordeal all afternoon because he's trapped in a way that means they can't pull him out from under rubble without risking harming him far worse or killing him. They have to lift it off him. 
He's in an 18-inch high space created when the ground floor of the building was crushed down almost to the ground. So no one has the leverage to pull off the stuff that's on top of him. They're going to have to go into the next story of the house and cut down through the floor, lift it straight up, and then they'll be able to save him without creating worse injuries. Multiple times during this process, they're hurting him so much lifting stuff off of him and maneuvering the stuff around him, they can hear him crying out. On multiple occasions, a fireman does an elbow crawl into that 18-inch high space full of molasses with Barry and injects him with morphine to kill the pain. He has a bottle of brandy and he gives, he gives Barry sips of brandy as well. Finally, the rescuers are able to lift the collapsed beams off of him and lift the hot water heater off of him that was pinning him down and take him out alive, if not well. The Haymarket Relief Station has 25 beds. Almost immediately after the disaster, there are more than 40 injured people in there. Then priests are coming in to give people the last rites. Then family members and loved ones are coming in to see if their loved one made it. The place is overwhelmed with molasses. People are dripping with it. The victims, the rescuers, now the staff. It's all over the floor. It's soaking from the bodies of the victims into their bedding. Everything is sticky. Nothing is clean. Back in the North End in the molasses blast zone, Recollect that this is a working waterfront, so there are constantly loads of stuff being delivered to and from ships and into and out of railway depots. And a lot of hauling is being done with horses and wagons since 1919. Horses have not been entirely replaced by automobiles yet. A lot of horses were caught and killed in the molasses flood. A lot of other horses were not immediately killed, but are so injured that they have to be shot. The police are wading through the molasses, shooting injured horses who are stuck in the molasses. This goes on all afternoon. Sometime after 1pm, William White gets back from having lunch with his wife to find that the tank no longer exists, and now the site is the center of a gigantic blast radius of molasses, with injured people being recovered and dead people being pulled from the wreckage. Presumably reeling with shock, he phones the Cambridge site and tells Arthur P. Jell what just happened. In turn, Jell phones USIA headquarters in New York and they tell him not to talk to anybody. Jell's one job is to prevent the police from getting hold of the pieces of the tank. USIA engineers are also on their way. Remember, USIA has engineers, they just weren't involved in building the tank? Well, they're on their way now to take charge of the pieces of twisted, violently burst metal that is all that is left of the tank. Bell tries, but Commercial Street and the area around it is a disaster site with the rescuers still getting people out alive and recovering recently dead people and the police won't let Jell onto the site. By the middle of the afternoon, Mayor Andrew Peters is at the explosion site. He makes a speech in which he promises to find the cause of the explosion. Those are his exact words. Note that the word explosion is allowing for the possibility that the tank was deliberately blown up by some malefactor. USIA now has a lawyer on the site as well, Henry F. R. Dolan. He makes a speech as well. His exact words include, We know beyond question that the tank was not weak. And, We do venture the opinion that something from outside opened up the tank. That was January 15th. By the 16th, the papers are full of the horrors of the molasses flood. The papers are full of wild speculation. A lot of people come forward with theories of what just happened. One of them is a chemist named Walter Wedger. Walter Wedger comes forward with a theory that the tank burst because of structural weaknesses and the pressure within the tank from fermenting molasses. This theory is hotly debated in the press. Dolan, the lawyer, is now out there explicitly saying that, quote, Evilly disposed persons destroyed the tank. It's January 17th. There are hundreds of people still combing through the molasses flood site to search for bodies. We're past the hope that they're going to find somebody in there still alive, but they want to recover bodies for burial. By the way, Arthur P. Gell didn't move fast enough to confiscate the tank pieces. The rescuers cut them up with acetylene torches and put them away in a scrapyard. 
Among the rescuers are employees of the Hugh Non Construction Company, who has volunteered a hundred of its own employees to help with the relief effort. USIA hasn't sent anyone to help. They only grudgingly offer to hire more relief workers when the Commissioner of Public Works scolds them for not helping. From right after the time of the explosion to days thereafter, there are distraught people wandering the explosion site looking for their loved ones. Giuseppe Yantosca, who is the dad of Pasquale, saw his son obliterated by a gigantic black wall of liquid and hasn't seen him since. Right after that, as soon as Giuseppe recovered from being flung on the floor by the force of the molasses explosion, he's been trying as hard as he can to get into the flooded area and search for his son and then going around the perimeter questioning everybody who he can get to talk to him in his limited English for news of his son. He can't find him. No one's seen him. No one has found Pasquale. Eventually, Giuseppe goes home in exhaustion. That was the 15th. Five days later, the death toll has gone up and up. And on January 20th, Pasquale Yantoska's body is found, crushed in between a rail car and a brick wall. That's where he was flung by the initial force of the blast, and he's been there ever since. His body is returned to his parents for burial. He was ten years old. At the Haymarket Relief Station, far more people than the place is designed to treat are packed in, and a lot of them are not expected to live very long. One of them is James McMullen the railway employee who was trying to scare the kids off of the site. He has compound fractures of both legs. If he lives, he is not expected to keep his legs. We never find out what would have happened. He ends up dying in hospital. A lot of people are in there with badly broken bones from being crushed in rubble. John Barry, the stonecutter who spent all that time pinned under the hot water heater, He's released to his family the same night, so he's able to go home and be cared for by the eldest of his ten kids. It's never clear what the extent of his injuries are. Possibly they weren't all diagnosable back in 1919. What we do know is that he suffered debilitating back injuries that meant that he could never stand upright without pain again, and he could never do his job again. He's 56 years old, he goes through a long, miserable healing process, and is never again able to hold down his job. In the days after the flood, families are watching their sons, fathers, brothers, husbands, loved ones, struggling and dying in hospital. Some of them die from their injuries, some of them die from shock or pneumonia. The same day that Pasquale Yantosco's body is recovered, the Clarity siblings are burying their mother, Bridget, who was crushed to death in the collapsed house. It's January 26th. Another body is found. This is a truck driver named Flaminio Gallieri. He was at the wheel of his delivery truck when the wave of molasses hit and flung his truck into the harbor with him still trapped inside it, and he was drowned in mixed seawater and molasses. One person is still missing. His name is Cesare Nicolo, and he was a delivery driver who was seen on Commercial Street right before the flood. He won't be found until May, when his body is pulled out from underneath a wharf. For the moment, the known death toll is 19 dead and more than 40 injured in hospital. Also remember, it's 1919. We don't have unemployment insurance or disability in the U.S. at this point. If you're out of work, you're in serious trouble. If you're injured such that you're unable to work for a length of time, or maybe ever again, you are in extreme trouble. If your husband is killed, for example, in a freak accident where a molasses tank explodes, and he was the sole support of you and your five children, your options are limited and bleak. Maybe you can find a job, maybe not. Maybe your kids are old enough to go to work themselves, maybe they're not. If not, you'd better hope that you have relatives who will let you crash with them for a while. By the middle of February, the molasses tank case is heard by a grand jury 
whose verdict is that USIA built the tank on safely. They're very explicit that the building department allowed USIA to have the tank built in a way, quote, not permitted by the law. With that said, they also decide that they don't have the evidence for a manslaughter verdict. USIA is not indicted. For their part, USIA continues to insist that some person or persons unknown blew up the tank with dynamite. Around this point, the Boston Elevated Railway hires a Professor C.M. Spofford from MIT to look into the situation. Spofford manages to access pieces of the tank despite USIA's best efforts to prevent it, and he concludes that the tank walls were too thin and that the tank itself was improperly designed. Following the verdict, bereaved families and injured people bring 119 separate lawsuits against USIA. There are so many of them that the court consolidates all of the plaintiff's cases into a single class action lawsuit. On the face of it, this was because there were so many lawyers involved, it was hard to fit them all in one room. But this is also a tremendous stroke of luck for USIA. The cases being consolidated means that USIA only has to succeed once. If they manage to discredit one witness for the plaintiffs, then it will weaken everyone's cases. And if they manage to weaken everyone's cases and they are not found to be liable for the damage, then they'll be safe and can put this in the past. So this is already a win for USIA. The plaintiffs are all going to have to be consistent in order to succeed with the class action suit. Oh, one other little detail that we should hit here is that one of the landlords of buildings that were destroyed by the molasses flood was named Dudley H. Dorr. He was made trustee for the plaintiff's cases, so when you look up the legal records, you'll find that it's referred to as Dorr versus USIA. It's summer of 1920. The hearings begin. This is not quite a trial, but it feels like one to non-lawyers such as myself. Testimonies are going to be heard by an auditor. The auditor is like a judge. He has to listen impartially to all of the evidence, form a decision about the evidence, and report on it to the superior court. His opinion will determine whether this needs to go to a jury trial or whether the hearings will be sufficient to settle the situation. So our auditor is Hugh Ogden, decorated war veteran, attorney in Boston, currently practicing corporate law in Boston. He'll have to hear every relevant speck of evidence, and he realizes pretty quickly that there is going to be a lot of evidence that applies. So he makes arrangements to be away from his law firm for at least six weeks. This is going to take a while. On the plaintiff's case, we have lead lawyer Damon Hall, Boston University graduate, he is seconded by another lawyer who doesn't really come into this narrative, but I mention him because he has the most Boston name I have ever heard. Endicott Peabody Saltonstall is the name of his backup lawyer. I just thought you'd like to know that. On the defendant's case, we have Charles Choate, graduate of Harvard Law School. All of the lawyers involved are wealthy. Most of them are of a social status where they have summer places on the shore which prevents the court from meeting on Saturday mornings because they're going to want to be away for the weekend in the warm weather. Ogden does make one bold scheduling move that he won't be dissuaded from. He decides that when it's necessary, he's going to continue the hearings into the evening and up to 10 p.m. if he has to. The point is that a lot of the witnesses are working class and have to keep their jobs and can't easily take a day off work to come testify. Damon Hall starts his opening statement on behalf of the plaintiffs by saying that he's not going to talk about what his argument will be as yet, but just sum up the facts. He then describes very much what I've just been telling you, including making the point that I have not made yet, that not only was the tank located in a densely populated residential area, but there was a playground right next to it. If the explosion had happened in summer, the playground would have been full of little kids and the death toll would have been even more horrific than it wound up being. Certainly, he sticks to the known facts, but the facts themselves are damning when you look at them together. The tank was unsafe. It was known to be unsafe. It was built in a place where its lack of safety measures meant that it was going to take a lot of lives when, not if, it eventually exploded and that did, in fact, just happen. Charles Choate makes his argument clear from the very start. 
he is going to blame anarchists for blowing up the tank with explosives. I know I just said that with a skeptical air, but I also have to say, in fairness, that is not as unlikely an argument as it might sound to us these days. Real anarchists were actually out there blowing up real places and taking lives in some cases. Remember Isaac Gonzalez himself got that crank call from someone who said that he was an anarchist going to blow up the tank? That was not an isolated incident. In early January of 1919, before the flood, the police in the North End found a series of handbills stuck up on walls and fences, reportedly from anarchists who were angry over Luigi Galliani, who I mentioned earlier, being deported. The handbills read in part, You have shown no pity to us. We will do likewise. We will dynamite you. Now, nothing came of these placards as far as we know, but the timing looks meaningful. It looks extra meaningful if you really want the explosion to have been caused by a bad person. And those weren't the only anarchist explosions happening around the time of our story. In February of 1919, in the town of Franklin, Massachusetts, four known anarchists blew themselves up with homemade explosives and they died. This was understood to be a plot gone wrong. They had intended to bomb the mill where they worked. In June 1919, in Boston, anarchists blew up the home of Judge Albert Hayden. This was done in revenge for his imposing harsh sentences on the anarchists who had been arrested for a May Day demonstration. So, we have to admit, anarchists were real and some of them were really out there making their vision a reality by blowing places and people up. Even the expert witnesses for USIA are only in a position to say that the tank could have been blown up with dynamite. USIA still has no way of saying that it was blown up with dynamite. USIA only calls one eyewitness. Her name is Winifred McNamara. She lives in the neighborhood and she was watching the tank at the time that it burst. The only reason that her testimony is useful to them is that she claims to have seen some smoke rising from the top of the tank right before it blew. She didn't see anyone blowing up the tank. She didn't see an anarchist, for example, going in there with a bomb with a label saying this is for Luigi Galliani or anything of the kind. All she says is that she saw smoke going up from the top of the tank. Hall's response is to cross-examine her and make it clear that the tank was between her and the harbor, so smoke or steam going up from any of the vessels in the harbor would have been indistinguishable from smoke or steam rising from the top of the tank. Then the plaintiff's lawyers start calling witnesses. A whole horde of them. A man from the Boston Building Department testifies that the plates that Hammond Iron Works used to make the tank were 10% thinner than the ones that the specifications called for, and that the plans filed with the city were, in fact, a lie. The eyewitnesses who described the tank as rumbling, thundering, groaning, moving so that you could feel it, weeping molasses out every seam, all of them testify. Sailors come in who were on the Navy ships in the harbor at the time of the explosion. They were in the World War. They have seen the use of high explosives. Some of them are incendiary experts themselves. And they all say that the explosion of the tank did not at all resemble explosions from dynamite or anything of the kind. Most importantly, the plaintiff's case has Isaac Gonzalez who comes in and testifies to everything that he saw and heard and felt the tank do during the time he spent as a USIA employee, up to and including the last months of his employment there, where he reported on the lack of safety of the tank, including tremendous leaks from every seam, and Jill responded by painting the tank brown. Damon Hall wants to get Arthur P. Jell in person in court to testify before Hugh Ogden. USIA says that Jell can't possibly take time off work in New York to go to Boston. So Damon Hall and Choate and their stenographer and a couple of other people all have to go to New York, go to a hotel and have their conference with Jell there, question him, the stenographer takes notes, and Hugh Ogden will later have to make do with reading over the notes. By now, it's March 1921. The hearings have already been going on for months. 
Hall questions Jell and makes all of the points that I made to you earlier about Jell being completely unrelated in any way to construction projects or engineering projects and having no expertise or understanding of the matter. Jell's defense is that the time pressure wouldn't have allowed for exploring those options either. I'm going to read you one more little bit from the question and answer. Hall says, Any other reasons why the water test was not made? Jell says, It was considered an unnecessary expense. By whom was it considered an unnecessary expense? By me! There's a lot more question and answer all along these lines. It's a bloodbath for USIA's case. Damon Hall then goes to our friend from earlier, Professor C.M. Spofford of MIT, for expert testimony. Thanks to Spofford, the court hears that the tank would reasonably have been expected to have a factor of safety between 3 and 4, and instead had a safety factor of 1.8. And now it's time for the testimony from the victims. Many months of hearing from the victims follows this. Maria D'Astasio's parents speak to the court. George Leahy's family speaks. John Barry, the stonecutter, testifies in person. It's been years, but he's still in constant pain from his back. He can't stand all the way upright. He can't do most of the things that he used to be able to do on the job. He is currently at a desk job, but it doesn't bring in what it used to, and his quality of life has suffered from that as well. The firemen who were trapped under the Engine 31 firehouse along with him describe their experience, their fear, and their injuries. The Clority siblings, Martin and Teresa, testify. Martin tells the court about his experiences in the flood, the death of their mother, and following this, his physical and mental sufferings. He can't sleep at night. He has a hard time leaving the house. He has a really difficult time being in a crowded public place. He can't bear to go on the subway any longer. He can't bear to lie on his back in bed at night. He always feels like he's choking. He suffers from frequent intrusive thoughts about the flood and the unplaceable fear that his life is in danger. He's always on the high alert it seems. He says he feels depressed most of the time when he is awake in his day-to-day -day life, and he constantly relives the experience of choking and being crushed. His sister Teresa testifies she is suffering from similar symptoms, insomnia, what she calls nervous exhaustion, her hands shake constantly. She can barely stand to leave the house. The last time she left the house for any length of time was for their mother's funeral. They didn't have the expression post-traumatic stress disorder in the 1920s, but... To me, a layman, it feels very much as if that's what they're describing. And there is a third sibling who was also terribly affected. Remember Stephen Clarity? He was also flung from the house by the force of the flood. He is developmentally disabled, and he has not been able to understand what happened to him to any extent. He has been on the high alert, panicking pretty much constantly ever since. He keeps talking about bad people who flung him out of the house who he is afraid will come back and harm him further. It's gotten so bad that the siblings can't take care of him themselves any longer and they've had him institutionalized. And following this, in late 1919, Stephen Clority died of pneumonia, which he caught while in the mental hospital in which they had placed him. Some people consider Stephen Clority the 21st death caused by the Boston Molasses Flood. Ultimately, that was not the opinion of the court. It's my opinion, however, that his death is directly attributable to what he suffered during the flood. The testimonies don't end until July 1923. The auditor, Hugh Ogden, expected this to take six weeks. It's taken three years. Those transcripts fill 40 volumes in the social law library today. Endicott Peabody Saltonstall, the lawyer who I mentioned earlier, passed away during this process. Hugh Ogden himself asked for a brief recess from the hearings in order to attend the five-year anniversary of his military regiment, which last saw action in 1918. It has been a while, and it's not over yet. We still have to make our closing remarks. Charles Choate hits the anarchist note really hard and repeatedly. They are sticking to that anarchist. Nowhere in Choate's 
closing statement does he mention Arthur P. Gell, who might as well not have existed. Damon Hall makes merciless fun of the concept that an anarchist must have blown up the tank. One of the points that he makes is that that anarchist would have had to be pretty smart to know that William White, the superintendent, was going to impulsively take the lunch hour off of work to go shopping with his wife and strike right then. There is no anarchist, according to Damon Hall. There is no person with explosives. The tank exploded because of horrendous negligence on the part of the people building the tank and the people maintaining the tank. Hall's remarks shine a bright light on every choice that USIA employees made to have a total callous disregard for human life. Ogden finds USIA liable for the collapse of the tank. He completely rejects their story about anarchists. He rebukes Arthur Gell and every level of management above him for their negligence. The total damages amount to $300,000. That sounds like a lot, but it breaks down to about $6,000 a victim. Still, it's unusual for damages to be awarded at all. Or if they're awarded, they're usually not on that level in cases of death by industrial negligence. To take an example from near where I grew up, in 1872, in the Mill River flood disaster, there was a dam collapse that killed 139 people, and the inquest found the dam owners responsible. But there was no class action lawsuit, and no one was forced to pay any damages to the victims. It was treated like a natural disaster, and everyone seems to have gone on with their lives accordingly. If there was any protest or any feeling against the people who had built the dam and then it let it collapse. None of that protest or anger ever made it as far as the papers. Closer to the time of our story, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in 1911 killed 146 people, and the survivors and bereaved managed to bring a lawsuit against the owners and see them held responsible for wrongful deaths. The owners had to pay compensation that worked out to about $75 per victim. While at the same time, they received an insurance settlement that paid them an amount that you could break down to $400 per victim. So it didn't really affect their lives much in the big picture. So the USIA damages are not only unusually high, they're about to get twice as high fast. Damon Hall sees that USIA is tremendously relieved to settle out of court. Hall isn't. He insists on a jury trial. Charles Choate immediately asks him to come to terms. USIA winds up making a huge counteroffer in order to keep the case from going to a jury trial and accumulating even more bad publicity for USIA. In effect, more than doubling the damages that Ogden initially awarded. USIA will do nearly anything at this point to get the case out of the public eye and wrapped up. But the damage is already done. Hall, in his closing remarks, describes USIA as having said, in effect, to hell with the public, give us the tank and they've done nothing to contradict that since. So, have we as a society learned anything from all this? My personal individual takeaway is that if you think something is wrong and dangerous in a situation, keep making a stink until it gets addressed, even if people try to stop you or silence you. Then again, they might just respond by painting the tank brown, in which case all you can do is quit. You might have noticed there were already regulations to some extent in place at the time. The city of Boston required a building permit, but no one was checking on whether those regulations were being followed. In the case where Hammond Ironworks very kindly went above and beyond in filing their plans when no one really asked them to, no one noticed till way too late that the Hammond Ironworks was lying in those plans. One immediate effect was that the Boston Building Department started requiring engineers and architects to file their calculations, not just their plans, but their calculations, and sign their drawings as well as stamping them. And this regulation became standard practice in the US. That alone wouldn't ensure that anybody with the power to read a faulty plan and see that it was faulty was ever going to read that plan. The incident also led to the city of Boston requiring that any plan for a large construction project has to be reviewed and sealed by a licensed professional engineer. And that has to be done before the structure can receive a building permit. This requirement spread to the US overall, and so did the concept of certification laws for engineers. Another innovation for its day, the concept of zoning laws to see that industrial sites weren't intermingled with residential areas. 
So if building construction regulations ever seem to you to be a lot of fuss over nothing, please just remember that they're safety regulations. And in this case, we can point to the specific event which wrote them in blood, as it were. Also, the hearings reminded the public that businesses can't be trusted to police themselves. USIA's conduct was a grim reminder that businesses cannot be expected to put the value of human life over turning a profit. I'll go further. The incident was a reminder to people at large that big business isn't some unstoppable godlike force of nature that can never be affected by people outside it. Big business also isn't a selection of godlike people who have powers above those of ordinary mortals. Big business is composed of human beings, all of it at every level, and they're just poor chumps sometimes who are capable of making mistakes, like anybody could, and if those mistakes are not checked, they can kill people. So the idea that businesses need to be regulated and need to be subject to government oversight was a new idea for its time. I would say that the Boston Molasses Flood hearings, aftermath, and the USIA settlement reminded people that employers and industries can be held to account. It can be done. And that it's possible to have public protections from industrial harm, as long as we can keep those protections. In this case, please remember there were 119 individual lawsuits brought against USIA. I've gone into detail on a few specific people to give you a sense of what the human individual experience was like, but there were dozens upon dozens of people harmed by the molasses flood incident who I haven't been able to get into in this video. I'd like to end by reading you the list of deceased. This is from Dark Tide. I'll read the names and ages of people who were killed in the molasses flood. Patrick Breen, 44. William Brugan, 61. Bridget Clarity, 65. Stephen Clarity, 34. John Callahan, 43. Maria D'Estacio, 10. William Duffy, 58. Peter Francis, 64. Flaminio Gallerani, 37. Pasquale Yantosca, 10. James H. Keneally, age unknown. Eric Laird, 17. George Leahy, 38. James Lennon, 64. Ralph Martin, 21. James McMullen, 46. Cesare Nicolò, 32. Thomas Noonan, 43. Peter Shaughnessy, 18. John Sieberlich, 69. Michael Sinnott, 76.